Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's uh, edition of the Contract Administration Practice Group. I'm going to hand it over to Doug and Jim to do uh, their formal introductions and get going with today's presentation. Welcome, everyone. This is Doug. So today we're talking about visiting a construction site. I don't know other folks' experience, but I remember back when I first started doing this, my first trip to the job site, I was sent out on my own and kind of didn't know what to do, what to expect. And it's not something that they necessarily teach you in school, so this might be a good presentation that you might want to share with uh, your younger staff as you start sending them out to the job site. So with that, I'll get started, unless Jim, you want to interject at this point? No, no, I'm ready. So one thing we need to keep in mind is that the contractor is in charge of the job site. He has responsible control and in charge of the site. So whenever we go out to a job site, we must follow the contractor's rules and requirements regarding uh, being on that job site. Now our contract and his contract says that he has to allow us access, uh, but it doesn't say when or how he has to allow us that access. So there may be rules that he puts in place for safety reasons that we need to make sure that we uh, comply with. I would just add too that it's really it's really important to have a good relationship and part of building that good relationship on a job site is sticking with the contractor's requirements. What Doug just said is important. It oftentimes is not their idea but possibly their insurance carrier's idea. A lot of different reasons that may affect their direction to you on how to use the site. So when you go to the site, make sure you have your, the proper attire. Hard hats are, I think I can say, always required. Uh, hard sole shoes, hard sole shoes, no gym shoes, no flip flops, no sandals, need to be closed toed. Uh, shirts and long pants. Typically uh, you will not want to have short sleeves on, even though in the summertime it may be acceptable for short sleeves but no tank tops, muscle shirts, that kind of thing. Uh, for the ladies, no short skirts or dresses. Um, so we want to make sure that we are protecting ourselves from construction debris and stuff that's flying around out there and make sure that you don't have anything that's too loose fitting as well that could get caught or snagged on any item. Jim? I, I, I think you covered it. it. It's so very easy to get something caught and get off balance. And um, Doug and I both have in North Carolina here a friend who's an architect who, uh, unfortunately, she had something like that happen on a job site and uh, became injured and confined to a wheelchair uh, just because of a small snag and a trip uh, on a, a fall on a site, but just just from standing to the floor. So. You can never be too safe. Also, safety vests may be required by the contractor. They typically are. High protection may be required. Uh, if they require it, you need to make sure that you have it. A lot of times the contractors will have uh, PPE that you can borrow, personal protection equipment that you can borrow. Uh, oftentimes, uh, not often, sometimes I'll switch cars and or take the company car and forget my hard hat and my vest and we'll have to borrow one from the contractor. So uh, make sure that if you don't have the equipment with you for whatever reason that you check in with the contractor to see if they have some that you can borrow. Uh, eye protection, I wear eyeglasses, so uh, the glasses that I my prescription glasses that I buy uh, are suitable for eye protection, but if you uh, don't have a suitable pair of prescription glasses or you don't wear glasses or you got contacts in and your contractor is requiring eye protection, you need to make sure you get some uh, safety goggles. Now, there may be other safety requirements that uh, your contractor may require, but I think uh, what we went over the last two slides is pretty typical and pretty standard. But if there are other things, you need to make sure you comply with those too. 
just right there may be oh just going to add in here bob bob swan mentions uh it's also sometimes polite to uh, call the day before um to just hear what safety equipment you may need to bring along and what to expect um or be required for and additionally that way then you can establish your contract on the contractor side who might be your site visit contact for the day that's a that's a good point because uh Activities change, and there may be something lasting, for example, that's going on that is really more inherently dangerous than your normal construction activities. So you uh, probably want to be aware of what's going on on the site when you're going to get there. Yeah, that um, sprayed fireproofing comes to mind as a day that you might want to stay out of the building, and uh, and if you are in there, then there'll be a different kind of protective material. Uh, even even Tyvek suits to cover you up and allow you access. Once you get to the job site, make sure you pay attention to where you park. You don't want to block access. You don't want to block anyone's vehicle in. And you don't want to get blocked in yourself. And you certainly don't want to do like the young lady in this photograph is get stuck in the mud. Uh, I know I Levi shared a story once before where I parked on a job site and ended up getting locked in the uh, construction fence. So pay attention to where you're parking uh, and be courteous to others and also don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to get stuck or get blocked in yourself. So upon your arrival, once you have found a safe place to park, First thing you need to do is check in at the contractor's office. Uh, typically, they'll have either, uh, depending on the project, a trailer on site, or if it's a renovation or the work has proceeded far enough, they may have a space within uh, the building. Always check in once you get on site. Let the contractor know that you're there again. He is responsible for that site. He needs to know who's on that site at all times. Um, if you call the day ahead or a few days ahead and it's a scheduled visit uh, or it's a scheduled visit and the contractor is suspecting you, you still need to check in at the office to let him know that you're there. Sometimes they'll have a sign-in sheet and they may want you to actually sign in and sign out as you uh, arrive or leave the job site. And it's also important to arrange to have the right personnel with you during your visit or your walk it certainly makes it easier for the communication to occur and the contractor to be able to follow up on the things that you may see or, or have to say uh, during your visit so uh, having a representative along with you uh, is a good idea and this facilitates that right from the start yes and the contractors, sometimes they like to walk with you, sometimes they'll say they're busy or may not have that desire. Uh, I always will give them the option if they don't want to walk, that's fine. That I will touch base with them and get my field report out so they'll know uh, what my observations were. But if they want to walk with me, I welcome them to walk with me. Also extend that invitation to the owner's representative. If the owner uh, has the desire, the owner's rep has the desire to walk the site with you as well. Uh, it's rare, and Jim, I don't know about you, but it's rare in my experience that I will walk the site with one of my consultants. Um, typically, I will just have them go and make sure that they're doing their site visits to uh, cover their portion of the work, but it's rare that I actually am doing it concurrently with them. Right. Same, same for me. The next several slides are going to talk about safety. Uh, job sites are inherently dangerous, and while you're out there, you need to make sure that you are keeping yourself safe as well as the others around you. So stay alert, keep a good watch out. Uh, as the slide is saying, exercise the utmost care. Watch where you walk. Look out for things above head. Look out for things below. Uh, there could be holes, openings, spills, wet cement, a whole host of hazards that are out there on the job site. And it's my experience that guys out there are working, they're focusing on what they're doing, they're not looking around to see who is in the area that, that uh, 
might be in harm's way so that, that is really your obligation when you're out there is to look out for yourself and look out for others use care when you're taking photos or vis videos out on the site I would not recommend that you do like this gentleman and stand on uh, an elevated rail or platform uh, if you do need to get into a somewhat precarious position to get the photograph you need make sure you ask for somebody to spot you so that you don't fall or have something swinging overhead contact you while you're focusing through your viewfinder you can't see what's going on so if you're not going to be in a, a safe position there's a risk of something hitting you or you falling or slipping make sure you have a spotter with you um, to keep you safe and you could if the contractor is walking with you or one of his uh, uh, workers they can do that if you're out there and you see something and the guys are out there working I'm sure they would be more than willing to, to help you out for a couple of seconds while you can, you can get a photograph this poor gentleman if he were to fall I, I don't think he would make it that's not us by the way that uh, we, we do a lot for these webinars but we we don't pose for pictures like this <laughs> Remember that crane operators are watching their load. They are not looking out for people on the job site. They focus on what's on the end of their crane as well as the gentleman or lady that is on the site that has directed them to where they need to move and maneuver their load. They are not looking out for you. They're not looking out for anybody else. That is your responsibility. Several or oftentimes they'll have the caution tape around the crane that typically is just a clearance for where the base of the crane moves so even though you're outside of that tape that does not mean that you're outside of harm's way so make sure if there is a crane or any other type of equipment like that that's on site that you are looking out for them and don't think that they're going to be uh, looking out for you Matthew, that's right isn't it uh, Go ahead, Jim. I was just—I was just going to say, and and where, you know, where they may be lifting from, and where they may be positioning uh, a load, really is hard to discern uh, from where you might be on the job site. So, uh, particularly depending on the abilities of of those that uh, that are operating the crane. As Doug said, it's just something that we have to be aware of instead of expecting them to be aware of us. Anything from the audience, Matthew, or shall we proceed? Uh, looks like you can proceed at this point. I don't know where this, this individual came up with this concept to get up to change the lamp on this uh, uh, light pole but it I certainly would not go up this this makeshift ladder um, if you need to access something elevated be sure that you do it on equipment that is safe the contractor is required to provide us access to the site that includes access to uh, things that are up high or down low that we need to get to um, if you plan ahead, let them know you're coming. Let them know you're going to need to get up and, and look at something that's elevated up on the you know, 30, 40, however far it is up in the air. Make sure that he has made arrangements for the proper equipment to be there so that you can do so, whether it's a, a cherry picker or whatever. And again, follow their requirements while you're being transported in that equipment. If you've got to put on a harness and, and tie off, make sure you do that. So safety is of utmost concern, not only for you, also for the contractor. We want everybody to, uh, it shows up on this, one of my contractor friends used to say, we want everybody that shows up in the morning to leave the same way they arrived. So uh, yeah. don't take chances. Don't stand on top of buckets. Don't stack things on top of platforms to get yourself up. Make sure you're using the right equipment. And that may mean having to be, participate in some training that goes on at the site. Uh, I have uh, had projects where uh, we were asked to participate in 
uh, training use, for example, uh, of these various pieces of equipment, uh, particularly elevators that were on the outside of the building, uh, just in, in the off chance that you were on the elevator and something happened to the operator. Uh, they want you to at least know how to get the door closed and, and get it operating to get down to the ground. So uh, if those chances are there, we are not responsible for the site safety, but we are responsible for being safe on the site. That's true, and I've also uh, had some contractors require anybody to sign the site to go through a little safety training session prior to being allowed on the site, and they give you a little sticker that you stick on your hard hat to signify that you've been through the training, and if you don't have that sticker, they don't let you on the site. So again, whatever safety requirements that they have in place, you have to make sure that you uh, comply with them. If you observe an unsafe condition or activity on the site, you need to report it to the superintendent as soon as possible. As Jim just mentioned, we are not responsible for job site safety, but we are, as licensed professionals, responsible for the safe, safety, health, and welfare of the general public that includes the workers on that site. Um, you don't want to overstep your bounds or your contractual obligations and assume liability for a safety issue. So I would caution you and recommend that you don't tell anyone how to correct an unsafe condition, but you should report it. You better report it. Uh, I also would document it in my field report that I saw this condition. I reported it to the superintendent. If you took action immediately, I note that he took action, or if he didn't take action, I might note that he said he was going to do such and such as soon as he could or whatever the situation is, so that I'm also keeping the owner informed so when he gets my site report, he's informed of, of that as well. But job site safety is, uh, uh, has been a, a hot topic in the past. Uh, again, you don't want to overstep and tell somebody how to correct a situation, but if you see something and you don't report it, then um, you could be liable. Jim? Well, that's right, and we have heard stories of people that weren't even associated with a particular project that maybe just stopped by because they were curious about what was going on, and we had one here on the East Coast where uh, a licensed architect visited a site while he was on vacation. Uh, something happened there that day. He had given uh, his card to people on site to introduce himself and ended up being invited to the um, legal process in the end because he actually had been on the site. So even though he had nothing to do with the project, as Doug said, you know, we're responsible for health, safety, and welfare. And he, um, he was there and, and was deemed to be uh, negligent because he hadn't pointed something out. So always when you see a situation that may be um, a, life, a life-saving issue, if there is imminent danger in something that you see, even though we aren't responsible, uh, it is best to get the superintendent involved and get something happening about that right away. Matthew, I'm going to check in with you. I would think that we might have some comments on this this issue. We don't have anything posted yet. I'm not sure if everyone's already in their turkey coma or what. <laughs> but, uh, we'll, we'll see if anything pops up. I'll um, I'll kind of slide in between conversations if anything pops up. Okay, we'll keep going then. I have a, Matthew, I've got on on my screen, I don't know why it shows this, but Robert Swain has a question mark that shows up as an unanswered question. I don't know if that's just something that isn't turned off right or just my computer. It might just be your computer. Um, okay. okay. Uh, it was Robert was the one that gave up the recommendation to call earlier. Um, a day in advance to ask some information. So that was his question. I've taken it off the screen on my end, but it might still be up on yours. Okay, great. Okay, so let's get into the reports themselves. Um, 
When you make the site visits, it's typically defined in your owner architect agreement, not the owner contractor agreement. Uh, we are obligated to do what we agree to do in our contract. Uh, if there are some different agreements between the owner and the contractor, then that may be something that the owner needs to work out uh, with the contractor regarding the contractor's expectations, but we need to look to our agreement as to when we make uh, and how often we make site visits. Anything, Jim? No, I, I, um, I, I don't think so. I think just I don't have anything to add to that one. Okay. Uh, you need to make sure that you are keeping up with those contractual obligations. If your contract says that you're going to be out there once a week, make sure you are out there once a week filing a report. Um, you definitely need to be out there, I would say, at least once a month because the payouts usually are monthly. Because you can't authorize or you can't certify the progress or the, the status of the work on a pay app without having at least being out there on a monthly basis to see what it is. Um, I also would say that every time you go by the job site, whether you're there for a site visit or not, that you should do a site observation report. Uh, if you're swinging by the job site, it's on your way home and you're dropping off a submittal that you reviewed that day and you wanted to get it back to the contractor. So all you do is park, run into the trailer, drop it off, or run back out and hop in your car and go home. I would still advise you to do a, a site observation report to note what you were there for and what you did. Uh, you would do not want to be caught into a situation where you go by the job site, say it was on your way home or on your way in, and something happened even though you weren't out on site, then there's that record that, yeah, he was, so-and-so was here at the architect's office, they dropped the submittal off, and someone wanted to question, well, why didn't you observe something that caused an issue that day? Uh, if you got it documented, I was there, I dropped the submittal off in the trailer and left and did not walk the site, and that kind of goes to uh, help protect you in case of uh, an issue that might have happened on the site that you did not even go out on the site to see. Absolutely. It's just as important uh, in documenting what you didn't do. Okay. I'm having issues, technical issues here. It's not going to the next slide. And it's not. Let me, there we go. So what do you document? You should document items that you are observing. Document the conditions on the site, weather conditions, manpower, activities that are going on, and you should also document action items, items that require actions uh, by the parties that you observe, and you may, or depending on what the item is, actually note who the responsible party is. Um, this photograph was actually one that was taken by Jim on one of his site visits, and I'm going to let Jim tell you the story behind uh, behind this. Yeah, I, I would just share you you know, Doug was talking about safety and that being paramount and sometimes we don't even know where we need to be safe. Um, this was a contractor's response to forgetting uh, about some electrical cable that needed to cross from one side of the project to the other and so they had this ingenious idea of using this giant conduit um, which of course is a storm drain system that runs across the site and these are actually live wires um, you can see the, the glob of cement there uh, adhesive that they use to cover uh, a splice that they made in the wires and then the ones that you see that are uh, just at the edge of the water there are actually all of those wires were hot uh, they were live and so we're walking the site uh, looking at um, the project for a final uh, substantial and final inspections and, and pull this lid off just to see that, that they had cleaned um, 
the manholes, uh, the, the storm drains, the junction boxes out. So first you never know uh, what, what's going to be found. Uh, you never know what you're going to see. And um, while you are seeing it, you need to take great caution uh, in that. I mean, if someone had, you know, stepped down in this hole, they would have been killed. These are not low voltage wires. So the conditions that you find in some in some of your visits are going to require immediate action. This was one of those life safety things that we had got everybody out of the area and got it cardened off and, and got the power shut down, which was a huge interruption to, to the project and to the property, but there was no other choice. And, and honestly, the people that did this work really didn't think it mattered. I would also say we need to be careful about how we say things in our field reports. Um, we don't want to expose ourselves to liability for slander. Right. Um, or being judgmental. Yeah, saying saying something like uh, the roofing contractor is terrible. He's this is work is just totally unacceptable would not be the proper way to say it in a site report. Uh, what, was, what was going through my mind as I looked into this hole is not what I wrote down on my field report. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got an issue, just state the facts. It's okay to even put in opinions and in fact it might be a good idea to, to preface something with in my opinion, in my professional opinion so that you are not uh, risking someone trying to sue you for slander, defamation of character, interference with contract, those type of claims. Uh, I see, at least on my screen, it looks like there are a few comments, so before I move on, we'll check in with uh, Matthew. All righty, we do have a few here. I was waiting on. Well, we got two comment questions here from Shane David. First one: Do you ever uh, leave a handwritten site observation report so that the contractor can start correcting the issues that you observe? I don't. What I do is, if the contractor is not walking with me, if I see something, I will before I leave the site get with the superintendent and let him know what I saw. Uh, if it's a life safety thing, I'm going to stop in the middle of what I'm walk, what I'm doing. If I'm walking aside, as soon as I see the life safety thing, I'm headed to find a superintendent. If it's not a life safety thing, and it's just a simple modification, correction, something that needs to be done, I will get with the superintendent before I leave the site. I typically, in fact, I don't think I've ever left a like a, a draft or a handwritten report. I'll, uh, I'll answer that uh, in a different way uh, because of a, a place where I worked. Uh, I, that corporate policy uh, and, and the tools that we used when we worked there, the site observation report was a three-copy carbon, and they all were handwritten, and they all were done while you were on the site and the direction was that you leave one of those copies on the job site before you leave the property. Uh, I never liked that and so I'll say in the second on the other side of that fence uh, Doug has pointed this out before that you know time to ponder and think about what you're saying or what you may be directing or how you're responding to something is, is critically important. And having that time from when you've done the visit to go back and contemplate what, what you're, you know, arrange your thoughts and present that in the most professional manner, I think is a much better practice um, as far as delivering a field report. You know, if you can get that to them the next day, then that's plenty soon enough. All right, and that kind of goes into Shane commented additionally after that saying that he had been requested to do this um, due to the speed of the construction and follow it up with an official type version once he got back into the office. Um, right. But I think that really kind of what you were all talking about there. 
Um, and then we have another question here from, or actually more of a comment, I guess, from Raul Hernandez, saying that he was told uh, to be careful on what is photographed and to only take specific photos, like the sample currently on the screen, as in not general overall photos, due to the fact that overall photos may capture an unsafe, unsafe condition that was not noticed originally on the site, um, but be used as evidence for a lawsuit down the road. And I guess if you have any comments or questions related to that. That is a risk, and, and Jim and I have talked in other forums about photographs and whether you take the overall photographs and you don't see something and something's in there, or if you take a photograph and it's on your computer but it's not included in your field report. Um, I don't know that there's too much that anybody can do that is going to guarantee that they won't be invited to the party, the, the legal proceedings. Um, I, especially if I'm not actually going to be out on site but I'm sending someone else to go, I will usually ask that they take a lot of photographs. Um, I don't worry, I don't have an issue with sharing the photographs. Uh, I am not overly concerned about not seeing something in them. Um, I think we still need to keep in mind what our standard of care is, which is what is reasonable, basically what's average. Uh, I guess it is a risk, but I mean, we, you take a risk when you get up every day. Uh, I don't have an issue with taking a lot of photographs. I, 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 the more to me, the more information, the better. And if I don't see something in there and it's in the photograph and it made it in the field report, hopefully the contractor or someone else has, can identify it and bring it to, to everyone's attention so it gets taken care of before something bad happens. I think it is important to, um, you know, as, as Doug is saying, you need to be very wary uh, and, and concerned and careful and just be professional and perhaps perusing those photographs before those reports go out for the story behind the picture uh, might be smart. Which brings us to another point that I think we're going to touch on later on is that when you're sending folks out to do these field observations and these field observation reports, it needs to be experienced people. I would strongly encourage you not to send the new guy out that, that is fresh out of school so that you've got somebody that has had some experience that knows what to look for and if you're going to send somebody that's, that's more green out review that report review their photographs before it goes out uh, one of the technique, techniques I use with our younger folks is the first couple of site visits I'll go with them uh, I don't do like it was done to me and just throw them out in the deep end with no life raft, but I'll go and, and go with them a few times. Then I'll let them go out on their own, but I'm going to uh, review their report before it goes out, as Jim was talking about, and I'll review the pictures that they took that they have not included in the report to see if there was something in there that they didn't see that needs to be uh, noted as well. So our caution about using inexperienced people out in the field. I, I, it, if you get to the end of the job as construction administration, you burned up hours during design phase, you're using up your fee, you're trying to be uh, as economical as you can, but I would tell you that this construction administration phase is not a phase where you should be looking at, at cutting corners. Uh, that's where most or a majority, I would say, of claims typically arise is during construction administration, and I would advise you to not to leave that to inexperienced staff. Anything else, Matthew? Just an amen to that from Shane. <laughs> I think I get to go from there. Okay. For some reason, 
my computer is not cooperating with me today. So I'm going to do this the old-fashioned way. Let's see if this gets me back. Nope. Okay, Jim uh, has pointed out in the past that for our AI documents, there are times and we, even though we may not like the term inspections, we are required to do inspections. We do inspections for substantial completion and we do an inspection at final completion. We recommend that you don't use a field observation report when you do an inspection you do an inspection report. You should make those documents be different documents. Uh, the AIA has the G704, which is their substantial completion, completion certificate. You can use that. Typically, you are attached to that a punch list. So if you're doing a, a punch list inspection for substantial completion, our recommendation is you don't just simply take your field observation report and start listing the items on there. Make it look different. Let everyone know that an inspection is different than a field observation and you can do that simply and clearly by having the documents be different and look different. Same thing is true for reporting non-conforming work. Um, if there is an issue that you need to note up as non-conforming and bring it to everybody's attention, uh, again, you may note it on your field report, but you probably should go ahead and do that. Take that next step and fill out a non-conforming work form. CSI has them, I believe AIA has them, or you may have your own. But uh, when the contractor gets that, that's going to cause us bring his attention it's going to you know send the lights and the bells off uh, there's something I need to take care of as opposed to just getting a field report that he gets weekly or sometimes more often so you want to make sure that uh, you're using the forms correctly and so that you can bring attention to stuff you need to bring attention to and these these items have significant bearing perhaps not at all uh, if things go well and the project uh, is one of those successful harmonious happy kumbaya kind of uh, events in your life but perhaps could be very significant if things don't go well and everyone ends in litigation or arbitration or mediation um, so when you are at the point of going through discovery and people see that there was consistency from start to finish in how you operated and that there's um, consistency between what your professional organization like AIA or CSI or um, you know um, CCMA or whatever the organization that, that you're a part of and you're using those documents in a fashion that that organization established him to be used in. So these are the things that go to your accountability and say, well, if this is a professional organization running in a professional manner. Communications. I would advise you to deny to not to give instructions to the workers. If you've got a concern about uh, the way something is being done or something has been done on a site that you see, I would advise you do not go to the guys that are out there in there, the, the workmen or even the subcontractors, foremen. Take it to the superintendent. Uh, as we said before, the, soup, the contractor is in charge of that site. Uh, those guys should not be taking instruction from you. You shouldn't be giving instructions to them. That needs to come from the contractor, from his superintendent. Uh, we kind of jumped from 
field reports, the communications, one thing I wanted to throw in there and I don't think it's covered in, in any of these slides is when you're doing these field reports, I would suggest that you not only document the stuff that's going wrong or the bad stuff, uh, note the stuff that you see that's positive, the stuff that they're doing right, the stuff that they're doing well. You can imagine or try to put yourself in the contractor's shoes if every week he knows, well, I'm going to get a report from the architect and it's, it's going to have a list of all these bad things in it. And he's going to really look forward to getting that field report every week. So if you put some positive stuff in there, hopefully you've got a contractor that's doing something right. Note it in there as well. Uh, everybody likes to get compliments, so compliment them on the things that they're doing well as well as uh, documenting, pointing out the things that are going wrong. Absolutely. Questions. Oftentimes you are out on the job site and whether it is the contractor or a subcontractor or a subcontractor through the contractor asking you questions. Don't, and Jim mentioned this before, don't get pressured into answering questions right away. You may need that time to reflect uh, and, and consider how it's going to impact other things or what's going to be the most professional way to explain this or say this. So don't be afraid to say, I'll look into it, I'll get back to you, i got to get back, i got to check with somebody in the office, I need to confer with a consultant. So just don't get pressured into providing an answer right away, uh, especially if it's a contingent situation. You don't want to respond in the heat of the moment. Take that time to reflect and uh, be professional and give them a thorough, well-thought-out answer. Absolutely. I, I, that those are probably the most difficult times on the job uh, and oftentimes are when uh, some of the more intricate mistakes are made. Uh, so, you know, besides the fact that you have the opportunity to ponder and, and think on this and not react in a, in a pressurized situation, you also have people at your office or in your profession that you can collaborate with and, uh, and, and put more minds to the task. So while you're on site, I would advise you to do talk to the workmen. Uh, you can learn a lot from those guys out in the field, the guys that are out there actually doing it. Uh, I think a lot of folks would be surprised that when they get out in the field and these workmen are putting this stuff together that it's not always exactly the way that we think it's going to be and the way we have it drawn. And they have years, typically years of experience having done this stuff. They know how to do it quick and how to do it well. You can learn a lot for projects, your next project, projects going forward. How simple adjustments that we can make in the documents will make their life easier, make the project go faster and smoother. So, especially if you're dealing with some materials or products that you are not uh, familiar with or you're using in a new way, talk to the guys out in the field. I mean, we talk to sales reps quite a bit, and, and the sales reps will tell you what you want to hear so that uh, they can get their products sold, but the guys, the technical guys, the hands-line guys are the ones that you really need to uh, learn from and you can you can do that by when you're out in the field doing your site visit, stand around and watch them, ask them why, did, why are you doing it in this sequence, What's what what happened if we did this in a different way. So you can learn a lot from those guys and I think that they will appreciate that you are taking an interest in what they're doing. Matthew, anything new? Uh, Greg, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because I'm pretty sure I'll screw it up. Um, Greg asks, please discuss the need for closely defining the role of a third-party inspector. 
um, parentheses, AHJ having jurisdiction, um, in relation uh, to an architect's statement of defective work? The authority having jurisdiction, his role when he goes out on the site, he's looking for code compliance. Uh, they do do some checking to see that what's being built in the field matches the documents that they approve, but they are primarily looking for life safety items. Their job is not to enforce the contract documents. That is the architect's job. Um, I think the architect's role, in addition to also looking at life safety items, he's looking at are they doing it per the documents? Are they using the right products? Uh, you could have a wall section and you're showing flashing at weep holes to get the water out, and you want it done, and you got a certain manufacturer specified, say it's uh, as Jim's friend uh, Jose was doing. Uh, this is an inside joke between me and Jim. Jose was putting up this copper flashing that's got the rubberized back on it. Uh, you specify that, but instead that they've got a EPDM through our flashing. If the flashing's there, the building, the AHJ, he's going to say, yeah, it's there. If it's the wrong flashing, he's not going to really care whether it's the wrong flashing or not. That's the architect's job. So uh, I'm not sure if that's got to the point that he was uh, raising in that question, but that's that was kind of my take on it. it. We're really looking at different things. And the, and I would add just for the uh, these third party inspectors, uh, if we do a good job with our documents and a good job at the pre-construction conference, and we're we have some obligation to them to communicate what role they play and what inspections that they are, are required to make, uh, what how those reports get distributed. Um, but of course, any kind of modification or reaction to some failure that they define or, or point out would need to come through the architect of record or the engineer of record. So uh, while they have some authority in th that we assign to them, uh, any kind of corrective action would need to come through us. And, and I think it's important to get that established through, as we talked about communication, through the communication early in the project. And if it's other than AHJ, like a special inspector or a construction testing agency, they're out there, they have their specific jobs to do. Again, they can't direct the contractor, just like the AHJ can't, to do additional work that's beyond the scope of the documents. That needs to come through the design professional. Uh, Greg, if that helps, great. If not, uh, perhaps you can follow up with another question. Any others, Matthew? Just had one come in here from Rick. Uh, it says, uh, what has been your experience regarding the value of a CCCA working as the main administrator on a project, uh, parentheses, contract provisions, and construction-wise? Also, what type of clients utilize CCCAs in that type of role and the most that you know of? Um, is there been a benefit for this credential in today's market? Uh, well, let me take a swing at that first because I, I think absolutely there has been. Uh, my, my experience um, for clients that I've worked with, that uh, the, the ones that are using individuals with those credentials are more multi-property. Uh, they are people who have a continuing uh, maintenance and renovation kind of work. They see the value in the training that those individuals have, I'll say it this way, across the CSI spectrum, you know, from uh, 
being a building owner and just needing some new carpet or just needing some new paint and understanding project representatives and understanding facility management and understanding specifications and understanding project delivery, uh, those CCCA individuals have that broad knowledge base to add to an organization. So maybe they aren't necessarily looking for someone with an architectural license because they're not affecting life safety, but they're just trying to keep their property in good condition. And these individuals uh, are very interested in that designation. That's been my experience. And, and then in addition to all of those things for maintaining the property they have, what I see happen is those individuals get involved in the pro project management of new construction. Again, because they have that broad spectrum of background um, and are able to help the owner facilitate a relationship with a, a design team. Anything else, Matthew? That appears to be all we have at the moment. Continue on with your conduct at the job site. Don't use the toilets in the building. Uh, we tell the contractors not to use them even when we're doing our finals or our punch inspections. Don't use those facilities. Uh, it's just, it's not professional. When you leave the job site, just as you checked in, when you got there, I would advise you to check out with the superintendent at the end of your visit. Um, some, as I said earlier, some may have a sign-in, sign-out sheet, and you will want to make sure you comply with, with their requirements for that. Even if uh, they don't, it's common my opinion, common courtesy. Like I said, the contractor needs to know who's on the site at all times. So uh, check out as you leave. That's also the time if you've seen something that you want to point out to them or bring to the, their attention, you can do that at that point as well. Jim? Uh, absolutely, and especially when you know, you're uh, as Doug said, you're in a facility that's going to be locked down and, and you in danger of getting locked in or you're in a place that has um, other sorts of security requirements uh, to enable the superintendent to clear the building and, and shut the project down. It's really important. All right. Well, we don't have any additional questions or hands raised here. Uh, but again, thank you, Jim and Douglas, for uh, today's presentation and answering some more questions. That's great. Doug, take care. Great job, man. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew.